One of the greatest things that we can do in the midst of turmoil is to let go. <laughs> in this week's podcast, we're talking about the benefits of letting go and watching God move in ways that he never would have moved had we kept our hand on the steering wheels of our lives. Can't wait for you to hear this podcast. Welcome to another Portions podcast. It's so awesome to come to you each and every week. We've got two portions left in the book of Leviticus, and today we're in Leviticus chapter 25, and it is going to be absolutely amazing because we're talking about Jubilee. We're talking about land Sabbath. Yep. We're talking about God being glorified, not only in the way we treat people, but even the way we treat our land. Absolutely. I mean, it's kind of amazing. Everything about God should be life-giving. Yes. Everything. Yes. Like when sin and death entered the world, that was outside of God's economy. 100%. You know, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. God not only cares about our life, he, he actually cares about the life of our land. Absolutely. He cares about the life of the people who are working with us. Yes. So I want, I want to just dive in here. Uh, Leviticus chapter 25, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something about Mount Sinai that is just an amazing thing to me because the Lord spoke to Moses there. Didn't he say something like, come up and be there? Yeah. God communes with him. He's on Mount Sinai and he says, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land, which I shall give you, then the land shall have a Sabbath to the Lord. The land yes. shall have a Sabbath to the Lord. Honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That's something for us to do. Yep. But now it's talking about a land Sabbath. Maybe you can just dive off from there, sure. Nathan, and I'll follow your lead. Well, Scott, think about this. God set it up in the creation story, right? Six days he created, he did work, he rested on the seventh. Then he gave a command, I want you to do the same. God didn't get tired after six days. <laughs> God didn't need a break. Yeah. He didn't run out of creativity. I mean, I think about this every time we, we celebrate Shabbat. You know, it wasn't that the Lord ran out of ideas of, tree species, or he exhausted yeah. his creativity, right? At some point he stopped and says, that's good. Mm. That's what he calls it. He yeah. says, it's good. And then he tells us to rest just as he rests. Well, the thing is, God recognizes that we need that pattern. He wasn't tired. He knew we needed the pattern. Wow. We needed the reminder. And in the same way, he treats the land the same. We're going to see in this portion um, that God is very specific about how the people are to treat his land mm. that he is bringing them into. He's inviting them into his land. That is huge. That's huge. huge. But it's, it's very similar and it speaks to the creation story. God created the heavens and the earth and he invited men and women to enjoy what he created. And he invited them to tend the land. Wow. Even in the garden, right? Wow. He spoke things into existence. This is all the way back at the beginning of our Torah portions, Genesis 1, he speaks things into existence. He plants a garden mm. and he places Adam and Eve in the garden. Mm. Then he tells them to tend it, right? What's the point? God prepares a place, but he cares about the place. He cares about the people, but he cares about the place. So we see here, now God is calling them out of slavery through the Exodus, Leviticus, we're getting the instruction. You're coming into the land, and here's what I want you to know. There's a way to treat my land. Wow. Because it needs to have an opportunity to rest, wow. just like you need the opportunity to rest. Wow. So think of it, again, we're getting pictures of the character of God. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what happens. He, he gives them very clear instructions. Verse three, for six years, sow your fields. For six years, prune your vineyards, gather your crops. But in the seventh year, the land is to have a year of Sabbath rest. 
the land needs an opportunity to be replenished. Mm. Just like you and I need opportunities to be replenished and God commands it. Now think about this, Scott. It's not a suggestion. Mm -hmm. God doesn't say, you know what would be neat? It'd be neat if you guys just stopped for a day each week. He (laughs) says, I'm telling you, we talked last portion about the uh, feasts and the very first one he mentions is the Sabbath. It's a weekly cycle of making sure you stop Mm. so that God could be glorified and that he can prove himself faithful as we don't lean on our own productivity. Mm. The land has to do the same thing. And as a matter of fact, as we continue to read through the scriptures, when Israel neglected this command of letting the land rest, God put them out of the land Mm. until the land received all the Sabbaths it had missed. Mm. I mean, the scripture talks about this. So God takes it very serious And it's not just because he loves botany and horticulture. It's because he loves people and he wants his name to be holy in the way that he's holy. So we see these instructions on how the land is supposed to rest because it also requires the people to trust God. That's the thing. In a supernatural way. That's the thing. I I really see the, the struggle of the ages where man is concerned to say, look what I've done. Yes. That's so many times our identity as men is, ah, look what what I've done. Uh, I remember in our old house, we had a a lawnmower. (laughs) And uh, you know, you just, you mow your yard and then it's like, this is, this is pretty amazing. I actually just heard somebody, a, a speaker was just talking about that. They, they, they just mowed their lard and they just sit back yep. and they were like, yeah. <laughs> we get pleasure yes. out of seeing the, the land. I, I want so badly for my grass and my flower beds to look just perfect. God says, hey, listen, take your hands off for a year. Yeah. Not so that it looks crummy, mm. but so that you will never forget that I am the one that sustains you. I take care of you. I take care of yes. you. You know, and it's really interesting. Like when you look throughout scripture to the people that God chose, he didn't choose them because of their abilities. He actually chose them because of their inabilities. He didn't choose Israel because they were the greatest. He chose Israel because they were the least so that he can be glorified. Yes. So um, any time that we as men and women try to do something in our own that would boost our ego or our identity, I think God is just like preemptively saying, listen, at the end of that sixth year, I don't care how good those crops are. I don't care how fertile those fields are. Let them go and watch me work. Think about that. Think about the faith that requires, Scott. Yeah. What are we going to (laughs) eat? I mean, this is an agrarian society. They don't just go to the supermarket. Yeah. I mean, you got to plant if you want to eat. Yeah. And so this is a very real concern. And I love our God who says, I care about those practical things. I've thought about that. You know, imagine that God thought of it. (laughs) But so before we get to that, though, he he says, all right, every seventh year. okay, this has to happen. Well, then he says, after seven of those sevens, when it's completely fulfilled, yeah. then there's supposed to be a Shemitah year, the year of Jubilee. Nice. Shemitah in Hebrew means to let go. Mm. And what happens, not only is this another year of Sabbath where the land has to rest, this is the completed cycle. This is the seventh seven. And he says and in that 50th year, not only do you have to let it rest, but any land that was bought and sold, Mm. it now reverts back to its original owner. Mm. Think about that. (laughs) You think, how crazy. I worked so hard. I bought this land. I've worked it. Our families lived here. But now it's the year of Jubilee. It's the Shemitah year. The land reverts back to its original owner. And there's a reason for that. Is that God was ensuring no one would ever be in poverty. Wow. Because if you made good business decisions or bad business decisions within that Shemitah cycle, you were going to be restored and have another opportunity. Mm. 
That is unbelievable. Mm. And it's God's system of making sure nothing wrong with prospering, nothing wrong with making smart business decisions. But at the end of the day, I'm not trying to let anybody beat anybody. I want to make sure my people are cared for. I love it. It's unbelievable. I love it. So you said that word literally means let go. To let go. Okay. So get a load of this. Beth and I, um, we, we, we met. And four years later, we got married. Mm-hmm. But in those four years, she broke up with me twice. Imagine that. How, how could she? How could Impossible. she? What did she not see <laughs> inside of me? I'm sure she's repented. I'm Scott. sure I'm she's really repented. Sure. But thankfully, we haven't broken up since the last that's time. That's the key part. That's, that's the, the important that's part. That's the key part. <laughs> so after the first time she broke up with me and I was madly in love with her, I fasted for seven days. And... At the end of the seventh day, I was not going to fast anymore. (laughs) And this is what I did. I've never done anything like this before or since. I was kneeling. I don't know if I've ever told you this story before. I I was kneeling by my bed in my dorm room and I picked up my New American Standard Bible, the one right before this one. And I closed my eyes. I said, Lord, I need a touch from you. And I went like this. And I, I need a word from you. I went like that and I looked down and this is what it said. Psalm 4610, Mm. cease striving and know that I am God. Some versions say, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And in the margin of my New American Bible, New American Standard Bible, it said, let go, comma, relax and know that I am God. So God was saying to me in my relationship with Beth, do you want to see me as God? You can you can continue to till the ground of this relationship if you want. Yeah. But if you let go, take yourself out of the driver's seat Come on, dude. and let me yeah. drive, then you will know that I am God. So now, like it says, cease striving and know that I am God. Now, I, whenever I see that, I, I'm like, cease driving. S- just it. stop. Let go. Let go. Shmita. 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 Let go. Let go. Because when we do that, then if anything, if anything comes out of this, it's God's doing and yes. not my finagling my my debonair ways. Yes. yes. When Beth and I got married, as rocky as our premarital time was, and it's we never fought. Sure. She just couldn't figure out if she loved me or not. Sure, sure. Once I let go, and once I let the Lord work in her heart without me doing everything I could to convince her, then her love was not based on anything that I did. It was based on what the Lord did in her heart. And thank God we're celebrating our 36th anniversary in July. It's really amazing. So that that just popped out at me. I couldn't resist. But when you said let go, it just really struck something inside of me. Well, what a powerful principle. That's the whole idea. We have to trust the Lord. Yeah. And so, and God even says, verse 17, do not take advantage of each other, but fear God. I'm the Lord, your God. He gives that instruction because he's like, I know you guys Mm. don't start doing math (laughs) saying, well, I'm going to sell this, you know, in the first year of the Shemitah cycle. So that means I've got 49 years, you know, where I can profit off of this. He said, don't take advantage of each other. Yeah. Yeah. Be mindful, you know, but then he says this. Um, let's, let's look at verse 18. Follow my decrees and care, be careful to obey my laws and you'll live safely in the land. The land will yield its fruit. You will eat your fill and live there in safety. You may ask, what will we eat in the seventh year if we do not plant or harvest our crops? Wow. I'm just being honest. That's a great question. That's a great question. You're like, God, what do we do? Here's what God said, verse 21. I will send you such a blessing in the sixth year that the land will yield enough for three years. Wow. Now, now, I'm not a math major, Scott, but you think, okay, well, what are we going to eat this year? Why would God give me enough for three years yeah. in the sixth year? Yeah. Well, I got to eat that year. Mm. In the seventh year, we don't get to plant anything. So we got to eat the crop for that year. That's wow. the second year. Right. But we can't plant anything that year. Mm-hmm. So we don't get to plant until the eighth year, yeah. which means we don't have anything to eat then either. Yeah. So think about this. Stopping meant that for the seventh 
and the eighth years, yeah. we wouldn't have a harvest. And God says, I got you covered. I got you covered. If you'll trust me in the sixth year, it'll yeah. be so abundant. Wow. Now, Scott, think about this. You're there in Israel. It's the sixth year and the bumper crop is coming in. <laughs> the temptation. Mm. Well, man, if we're killing it in the sixth year, next year, what if we just kept pushing? Yeah. Maybe we'll reap four times as much. Mm. And the Lord said, I told you, you're supposed to rest in that seventh year. Mm. And again, it's the heart test. It's the generosity test. Mm -hmm. Will we trust the Lord and let go? Mm -hmm. Or will we keep trying to ride the gravy train, you yeah. know? Yeah. And God says, if you'll trust me, you'll live safely in the land. Mm -hmm. You'll have everything you need. And then what an amazing principle that they had to live this out. It wasn't theology. Mm. This is, what are we going to eat this year? Mm. God says, trust me and I'll provide for you. I love that so much. It's very, very practical because we live, we live in a time and a season where we're, we're capable of doing just about anything. Sure. We have technology at our fingertips. And it's interesting because when all throughout the scripture, when you see God moving, it's when man comes to an end of himself. It's when man says, okay, look, God took the children of Israel out of Egypt. When? When the children of Egypt, children of Israel just cried out and said, Lord, we're at an end. God produces life through Abraham and Sarah. When? When they were capable of doing it? No, he let their bodies die. Romans chapter four, Abraham's body was as good as dead. Sarah was beyond the age of childbearing. Israel Coming back to the nation of Israel, coming back to the land, they're gone 2,000 years. Who in their right mind would think that God would bring yes. them back? And he does it supernaturally. That's the story of the word here. If we're gonna rely on our own strength, our own ability to plant crops, our own ability to produce children, yep. we're gonna be producing things outside of the realm of God being glorified. Yes. And uh, it's really, really interesting. We only have a couple minutes, but I just want to talk about um, just one or two verses tw uh, in chapter 25, verse 23. Uh, well, let's go back to 22. I think we touched on it. When you're sowing the eighth year, you can still, uh, back to 20. Um, what are we going to eat? Yeah. You talked about this in the seventh year, if we do not sow and gather the crops, then I will so order my blessing it has nothing to do with you. Exactly. For you in the sixth year, that it will bring forth crops for three years. When you're sowing the eighth year, just like you talked about, you can still eat the old things from the crop, eating the old crop until the ninth year when its crops come in. Then 23. The land, moreover, shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, for you are but aliens and sojourners with me. Let me tell you something that should be underlined in everybody's Bible. Scott. Yeah, that is a big deal. Whose land is it? It's his land. It's his land. Yes. The earth is the Lord's yes. and the fullness thereof. And when God takes something that's his and gives it to a people with trust over it, far be it from any man to say, yes. this land is not yours. And we're living in days where there is such a struggle over this land, yes, this land. And I don't want to get too deep or philosophical, but maybe we're in, uh, maybe we're in a season where God is looking for not our ability. And I say our, as, as a Jewish person, not our ability to keep the land. Mm -hmm. But our ability to say, yes, God's given us this land and we trust in you. We don't trust yep. in our army. Yep. We don't trust in our ability to preserve it. Yep. We trust in you. Yep. And I believe that's what the Lord actually is waiting for. In, in the book of Exodus, the children of Israel had to cry out to God because they were unable to do anything in their own power yes. under the slavery of Pharaoh. Right now, Israel can rely on their own power. They can rely on their own resolve. They can rely on their own uh, uh, military. Sure. And I am not wishing for anything bad to happen to Israel. At all. But we have got to say, 
Some trust in chariots, yep. some trust in horses. We remember the name of the Lord our God. If the Lord can take our land when we don't plant crops and give us three years of crops, yes. when it's his land, yes. we can fight all we want, but we're not gonna have true possession over it until we as a people, Israel, recognize this isn't my land. That's exactly it's right. your land. Yeah. Thank you for giving it to us. Yes. How shall we then live? Close this out. That's the point. How should we then live? It belongs to him. It's for him. And truly, Scott, any of us who have given our lives to the Lord because of the blood of Yeshua, we don't belong to ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we have to say, Lord, how would you have me live? Amen. Where would you put me? How would you use me? When we live that way, we'll bring glory to his name.